Hi, welcome to Flywheel Fridays, keeping up with the federal IT news cycle, one conversation at a time. I'm Alexander Bolova, media producer for GovCIO Media and Research. With me today are my wonderful co-hosts, Melissa Harris, Kate Macri, and special guest, Adam Patterson. Melissa, Kate, and Adam, welcome to the show. Thank you, Alex. Great to be here. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Before we dive into our conversation, Adam, can you introduce yourself and your role at GovCIO Media and Research? Definitely. Uh, I am Adam Patterson. I am the uh, staff writer and researcher here who covers Veterans Affairs, and by extension, a lot of VA's medical research and public health. So that's a secondary focus of mine, looking into things like diagnostics um, and large-scale medical research programs. Awesome. Well, welcome to the show. We just finished our infrastructure cloud modernization event, our first in-person event in over two years. My first question for you all is, what was it like to be back in person? I can say that I'm glad my suit still fit. Um, that was a positive sign. Um, but on top of that, it's it's interesting being back in person for events because the energy is clearly quite different. You know, we had been sticking with digital events essentially for the past, as you said, two years, a little bit more than two years. And it's nice to be able to talk to a room. It's nice to be able to engage with people. And it's nice to be able to sit in the same spaces as the people you're interviewing. You know, there's a certain kind of energy and conversation you can't really have otherwise. I completely agree. I moderated the last panel and it's really nice to see how like some people, well, I say some, but uh, many of the folks stick around. I feel like with virtual events, it's easy for people to, you know, walk away, close the program. So it's nice to see that active audience engagement and also leaving room for uh, audience questions. I feel like there's definitely a greater dialogue that happens with all people attending, speakers and audience included. Of course, from the moderation perspective, it's really nice to get that dialogue and synergy on the stage that you wouldn't otherwise get uh, in a virtual environment all of the time. That's not to say that the conversations we have at virtual events are of less value, but there's definitely a kind of, as I said, synergy that you get there. Yeah, I agree with all of that. I actually prefer moderating in-person events to virtual events. I feel like I actually felt like moderating in person was less stressful because it was easier to see like people's like, you know, reactions to things and it just felt more natural and organic. Whereas I feel like for virtual events, like, I don't know, I was always worried about like my Wi-Fi dropping while moderating or something like that happening. And I didn't really have to think about that this time. So yeah. I agree with what everyone else said as well. It sounds like it was a great return to in-person events. Let's get started with our recap of cloud modernization with our first panel, Cloud Security, moderated by Kate. Kate, what did you discuss? So I think one of the most interesting things that we discussed was the role of the user and user experience when modernizing cloud applications and trying to keep them secure. So, I mean, as DISA CTO Steve Wallace said on the panel, one of the big goals of the Thunderdome Zero Trust prototype, which is a $7 million contract with Booz Allen, is to improve the user experience so that security protocols for DOD employees are not burdensome and aren't so over the top that they can't access the network or the data that they need in order to do the jobs. Because as he said, and as Kevin Walsh, director of IT and cybersecurity for the Government Accountability Office also said, if you make security protocols too difficult or too just too burdensome, too complicated, if you're making people like, you know, do like jump through multiple hoops just to like access something on the network, then they're going to find workarounds and they're going to find ways to basically bypass those security measures and do what they can to just do their jobs and make that easier. So, and that's not what you want. So I think that was a really interesting topic that was discussed, especially in light of the example from, I think Nate brought this up, Nate Smolensky, CISO of Netscope. He 
brought up the fact that solar winds, the reason why solar winds was discovered, the software vulnerability was discovered, was because someone got a multi factor authentication text for sign in and he wasn't trying to sign into anything. And he was like, well, this is a problem. I should probably tell somebody about this because I'm not actually trying to sign into anything. And then that's how they found it. And that's just pretty crazy to me, like how something like so simple like that can be such a, I mean, you've got like so many moving pieces there. You have cyber hygiene and then you have user experience. And I feel like those were some, like the two biggest themes of this panel. And I think they're two of the big themes that are defining what cloud security looks like right now. Our next panel was Cloud Architecture, moderated by Adam. Adam, what were your top takeaways from this panel? So it was an interesting panel because it was almost a, a meta question in terms of the panel topic. It was a big focus on how agencies configure their cloud setup to enable better usage of the cloud itself. And the biggest takeaway is one that is kind of obvious. It seems like a no-brainer, but the panelists outlined is something that agencies don't always seem to necessarily consider, which is that the point of getting to the cloud is not just to get to the cloud, as you know, a predetermined outcome, that it's the purpose of the cloud is to accelerate your overall modernization of your services, to enable certain new capacities, to cut down on inefficiencies, to essentially make the delivery of certain services or, or essential functions of your agencies better. And that meant you have to really consider the particularities of what you need. You know, you don't go, for example, to a hybrid cloud if you don't need to. Um, you could stick to a singular cloud provider, really essentially reconciling your cloud architecture with the ultimate strategic needs of your modernization program. That was a really uh, big foundational takeaway from what I saw. And uh, beyond that, in terms of what else we discussed in the panel, we'll recap it really quickly. We outlined how, you know, the cloud architecture, once it's been established, is, uh, you know, once it's been done correctly, can really help, therefore, you know, as we'd mentioned, uh, enable capacities that previously wouldn't have been possible. So really using the cloud architecture to, to scale things or to support things like, for example, large-scale data processing, um, recollection of information, usage of things in, in analytics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, that is a multitude of applications, whether or not it's, it's military efficacy to um, various forms of, of advanced diagnostics and medical research. So those were real big takeaways. Um, and those were, seemed, were the real focus of what we centered on. Awesome. Our last panel was hosted by Melissa and focused on accelerating data-driven decisions. Melissa, who is on the panel? Thanks, Alex. On my panel were Army People Analytics Deputy Director, Lieutenant Colonel Kristen Sailing who preferred to go by Chris, so I will refer to her that way, as well as Denoto's SVP Data Architecture and Chief Evangelist Paul Moxon. On the panel, which, you know, was the closing part of the program, sort of built away from the technological aspects of cloud and more toward the people aspects. This was more so about getting to the data, which we can, you know, leverage better in some regards in the cloud. But as Paul was mentioning, sometimes the cloud can inhibit if you're just acquiring something, the shiny new object, as they say. Here, they were talking a lot about data literacy and the importance of training personnel so that they can understand how to use data for different business cases, um, in many cases, how they can workshop those skills once they get an understanding. Uh, this is what Chris is doing at Army People Analytics. They also talked about how it's important to have these kind of data literacy programs to build a culture that normalizes the use of data and uh, leveraging data in decision making. Paul was talking about how you know some people will be in their positions for decades and are used to doing things a certain way. That certain way is not always data driven and can be a little flawed. So if you have these kinds of training programs where you sort of get back to the remedials of sort of different ways of thinking about business, showing how data driven tools, uh, whether it's in the cloud or automation or whatnot can help accelerate certain low value processes or just change your way of having uh, data informed 
decision making. These kinds of training programs are really important for getting to the soft skills and culture build and just general way of changing or tweaking how we do business processes with data and technology. Before we wrap up, do we have any closing takeaways from the event? Any thoughts to leave our listeners with? I think just seeing people in person again, it's really nice to see panelists from different agencies and private sector groups coming together to share thoughts and bounce off of each other's you know, comments in different ways. Um, behind the scenes, off stage, you know, we all get chatting and it's something you don't necessarily get in a virtual environment either. So I think that there was a good through line with the technology and different aspects of the cloud and just seeing this awesome group of people come together to bring those thoughts to the table was a unique experience. I second that. Likewise. Fantastic. Well, if you missed the event, all panels from cloud modernization will be available to watch on our website. And if you're interested in more GovCIO media and research events, our next virtual event is AI Gov Data, which will be held on June 16th. And our next in-person event is Women Tech Leaders on July 14th. We look forward to seeing you there, but until then, that's all for today's Flywheel Fridays. If you enjoy this episode, keep the conversation turning by subscribing and leaving a review on the podcast platform of your choice. I'm Alexander Bolova. I'm Kate Macri. I'm Adam Patterson. And I'm Melissa Harris. Thank you for listening. Flywheel Fridays, along with GovCast, HealthCast, and CyberCast, is a production of GovCIO Media and Research. For more podcasts and to check out the other shows, head to govciomedia.com. Watch out for new episodes released weekly across our shows. You can follow all of them in your favorite podcast platform. And if you like what you heard, make sure to let us know by leaving a review. And if you have any topics you think we should look into, contact us at newsletter at govcio.com. How was breakfast at the event? I thought it was great. Yeah, it was a really nice spread. They had, it wasn't like one of those breakfasts where they only have like, you know, basically one option. There was like lots of options. They had the breakfast burritos. They had a whole like pastry and bagel setup, And then they had these really delicious like yogurt parfaits, which I think were made with like Icelandic skier yogurt. That's what it tasted like. So it wasn't super sweet. It was delicious. So good. And then they had eggs, bacon, and potatoes and fresh fruit. So it was very lavish. <laughs> We also had fancy carafes of like assorted juices, very fancy. Our coffee spread had not just milk and cream, but coconut milk. And the little placard for the eggs described them as fluffy and there were chives in them. And we also had tiny Tabasco bottles, like the individual ones that are like this big, like an inch big, very cute. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think anything is inherently better and fancier if it's in a carafe 